Welcome back, everyone, uh, from this coffee break. Uh, welcome, of course, also to those of you that are following the live stream over the web of this symposium, the Digital Society Symposium at Lund University. Um, we will now hear four different speakers from Lund University. Uh, I will not take audience questions after each and every one of them, uh, but if you do have questions, please note them, keep them in mind, and then when we have the panel discussion at the end, you will get a chance to ask them. On the topic of data society, social and normative implications of a data-driven prediction, we will hear Associate Professor in Technology and Social Change at Lund University Internet Institute, also a researcher at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Stefan Larsson, welcome. Thank you. Here we are. Yes. Um, Thanks. Um, it will be. Uh, I'll be talking about data and some of the some of the kind of mechanisms for data collection. Uh, some of the detail. Um, it's not going to be as broad or uh, gloomy as the democracy talk we just had. The great talk we just had. Um, but some of the mechanisms. So, because um, we generate as individuals. Um, a great amount of data these days. Uh, and I, I address specifically commercial issues, because you could, of course, generate data for uh, lots of issues. But I focused the, the commercial perspective. And I put forward three that I regard as uh, normative challenges that I think we, should, we, we need to spend more time to figure them out better than we have done in contemporary society. Uh, and these are issues of transparency in terms of, you know, do we see and do we f understand when we generate data and how it's collected. Uh, it's um, the issue of consent, because much of the how we regulate the, the, the commercial actors and the individuals, that, that kind of relationship is driven by consent, in a sense. We agree to it, in a sense. So, but it's kind of problematic from many perspectives. And also, just briefly, some issues on privacy, in terms of a privacy paradox between how we act and how we, what, between what we say and what we do, uh, essentially. Um, uh, I come from the social sciences, uh, and as a PhD in sociology of law, I always tend to focus on the role of law in, a, in a, you know, that's one part of the mix, but also behavior, the sociological part, uh, but constantly staring at digital developments, right? Uh, first of all, which you also heard from uh, Professor Lessig, internet has changed. It's old, in a sense. It's not what it used to be. It used to be uh, something you entered, or perhaps kind of looked into, uh, the space, the cyberspace. It used to be more passive and more decentralized. Uh, contemporary internet is much more platform-based, uh, much more centralized and, and active, in a sense. So. Increasingly, we, I mean, we have become data sources, basically. We, are, we go online or we use digital devices and we are uh, recorded. So we are the sources for this. Um, and that, that data can be collected, analyzed. The, the, the analysis has been more refined, too, of course. Uh, sometimes traded, uh, used for targeting, sorting, and profiling. So. I'd say that this kind of datafication is one of the essential mechanisms for to understanding some of the um, challenges in a datafied society. Uh, that much of what used to be qualitative is now uh, highly quantitative. It used to be unrecorded and non-monitored in a sense. Uh, like what we say to a friend, when we say it, you know, to whom, who, who we hang out with and when we say stuff. Uh, things you search for, uh, all the sites you visit, what devices you use, all of that stuff, IP addresses, cookie data. Um, it's, it's measurable, comparable, and often commodified, and there are patterns to be recognized, right? So machines can learn from this. Uh, and of course, there falls a bunch of great um, 
consequences out of that, but there are some warning signs too, right? Uh, so if you combine those things, these kind of patterns, with classical demographics, age, backgrounds, uh, gender, then you have a very potent tool for profiling. So you could just, in a sense, more now than it used to be, the market sees. So it sees us, and it's tried to do stuff with that. Uh, yeah, I should mention, I mean, some of the greatest stuff that we, in a sense, love is like we get relevant search re results, stuff like that. Uh, media recommendations that kind of gets intelligent in figuring out what we really like, even, even the stuff we never seen or heard of. It kind of, fig they can figure out what fits my, you know, aesthetics or my, my needs. So it makes stuff efficient, seamless, and smart in a sense. But uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll lift up some critique to that in a moment. First, we should also understand data is increasingly the currency, right? It's as a currency. We pay for stuff by contributing with our information. Uh, and that's also the driver. We've heard much, we heard some, I mean, we, Lessig talked about the business models uh, of the platform um, players. They, they need data, right? So it's not necessarily truth, but it's the data. We need traffic, we need to generate traffic so you can measure people, because that is kind of the package you sell to the ad-driven industries and other industries. It, it leads to a bunch of stuff. It also leads that to that different types of data have different values. So certain kinds of information, like pregnancy, a move, or an imminent divorce, are especially valuable. And they are priced accordingly, so as they allow for potentially lucrative reclassification and targeting of individuals. So if you know if someone is pregnant, you also know what, they, what needs they have as a consumer. The same thing with uh, you know, divorce. Uh, you need, someone needs a new place to stay, probably. So one aspect of that is we, we move from something descriptive, telling things, describing things as they are, into more and more predictive. We get better, these tools get better at predict future events. Um, with high probability. So we of course, we might love when Google and Google Maps tells us there's a traffic jam. There will be a traffic jam to a very high probability in, a f you know, in a half an hour at a junction ahead. So we can avoid that. That's, that's, I mean, that's fantastic. And it's depending on large amounts of, big da of data, the big data, and smart ways of analyzing it. So we love those, those types of features, right? But do we really love when a store knows you're pregnant before your friends and family so they can offer you discounts for baby products? Uh, or when lenders, like the branches of lenders, sometimes called the predatory lenders, when they can kind of target a vulnerable group who they know to very high probability will never pay off the entire loan. They will just stay paying off the interest rate, which is also a tool you can make out of a lot of information and good analytics. You can time people's misery because that's when they need a, you know, a, a quick loan. Or um, how about death prediction and insurance rates? It's, I mean, there are a bunch of studies at least pointing towards that, I mean, the prediction of death is getting pretty good, and it's used by that types of branches. But to us, it would probably mean, okay, there are some ethical issues to consider, right? Um, I'll focus three more of a normative challenges, uh, and not the ethical issues right now. The first one, a classic. And we need to, I argue, be much better in figuring out how to deal with this kind of uh, lack of transparency. That we don't really, there's no way to be knowledgeable of when data is collected, what types of data, what types of players are collecting data, what is used for, how it's handled, who can see it, 
Where is the travel? Uh, are there flaws in it that will affect me later within this kind of digital economy with my information? Stuff like that. So it's too complex, it's too much data, and as an individual you could never really be transparent. But we need to figure out ways to increase that or deal with it better. Because right now the, the, the incentive is for the industry uh, actors is to collect as much data as possible. Because uh, then you can make business out of it, and you figure out ways to use it later. Um, one example would be uh, a Norwegian uh, study, uh, just mention it briefly, from 2015, made by the Norwegian Data Protection Authority. It's called Data Tilsynet. I think we have one from Data Tilsynet here. Uh, they they uh, made a study on um, the fr when you visit the front page of six Norwegian newspapers. So just visiting online, the front page, uh, and noted that at least 100 and 200, between 100 and 200 cookies were placed on the visiting computer. Uh, it does, I mean, that's not necessarily bad. I mean, you use cookies for a lot, a lot of reasons, but also that the information about the visitor's IP address, you know, the kind of online identity to the computer, was sent to 356 servers. Once again, it's not necessarily bad. You need those things for functional reasons, but still, you, you don't know. There were, on average, 46 third parties present in that visit. So it's not just the newspaper, it's a whole range. It's like a, I don't know. Yeah, 46 third parties, it's a lot. Of, it's a lot. And parts of that are probably ad-driven, so that it could be automatic ad bids going on. Uh, on, on like the ad exchange, it, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, and, and the key feature was that no visiting party knew that this was going on. So this is basically like a zoo of players going on, collecting your data, and you just kind of read about sports, right? So that's kind of a, um, it's very, it's an asymmetry, you could say, and that's problematic. Number two. And this is debated, and we debate it all the time in, 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 in many circumstances. There are a bunch of studies about it. But the fact that one of the key regulatory mechanisms between individuals' use of the Internet and all the apps and, and um, uh, whatever service you use, you, you tend to... It's, it's driven by a deal. You make a deal. So you agree that the service provider uses your data to a certain extent. And, and it's supposed to be a good contract that you could, an agreement that you read. And the problem is that in practice, if that's the model that governs it, in, in everyday digital life, you use several hundreds of these agreements. So in your mobile phone, you have 30 or 40 agreed or consent-driven kind of uh, agreements, right? So we don't, in practice, really regard it as agreements. It's more like a, a click step. You need to get by to, to get to the service, right? So some of the critique around that is that it's, in, fi in fact, a blind, non-informed consent. So, so we don't, in practice, as, as consumers or users, really uh, understand what, is, what it means. And we're not informed. Much of the consumer protection is shaped around this idea of informed consumers, right, to make informed choices. So that's kind of a discrepancy then, and a challenge. The third, um, of course, privacy. Uh, I, I choose this uh, to term it the privacy paradox because there is, in several studies, uh, quite a significant difference between the concern and the growing concern in recent studies. Uh, of that third parties or uh, service providers collect your data and where that data you know, ends up being used for. Concern that we are too much collected, right? So that concern when you ask people in surveys uh, is significant. But on the other hand, um, it's not really mirroring people's behavior. So people don't... Uh, try to get out of the deals or use uh, more privacy-friendly services or uh, um, um, try to mitigate that somehow. It's, it's a di difference. We, we use even intrus very intrusive services 
as a practice, but when we get to question, we say, no, privacy is very important. So it's like a paradox. And we need to figure that paradox out better because it's one of the fundamental issues of if we want to have this type of digital economy, uh, we need to figure this thing out. There are at least three um, interpretations in the studies uh, or in the literature uh, for why they, we have this type of paradox. And, um, one is um, uh, suge some, one of them suggests like an individual resignation. So people, even if they know about it, is, is this, uh, the data collection is on a structural level. Uh, another would be the transparency issue that I just mentioned. So if we don't know it, we can't protest. And the third would be more like privacy is in motion, right? So privacy is not what it used to be. So the younger might be more accustomed to just share data, and the older are more like the old-school version of privacy. And to, just to wrap it up, uh, <clears throat> many studies point to the idea that trust is a key. We need to kind of be careful about this trust. If, 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 if uh, the service providers get caught too much not um, protecting the ideas of privacy that the users have, uh, we might have a, um, a lesser type of market. We might ruin the parts of the dig digital economy that we see ahead. So it, it has clear bearing for, bearing for the future to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. I'll let you take your seat again. And uh, thank you so much. And you'll be back for the panel. Uh, now, over to rape culture, social media, and hashtag feminism. We have here the postdoc at the Department of Communication and Media here at Lund University, also an associate professor at the Faculty of Culture and Society at Malmö University. Right. Tina Skonius. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so now to something completely different. <laughs> both in terms of subject, but also style of presentation. Um, in this talk, I'm going to address the overarching theme of political changes in a digital society of our morning session by uh, talking about contemporary forms of feminist activism and how social media are changing feminist discourse and campaigning. And I'll be looking specifically at so-called hashtag feminism on Twitter, addressing rape culture using illustrative cases from the US and Denmark. So what is rape culture, and how are hashtags being used to call it out and resist it? I moved on her like a bitch, but I couldn't get there. And she was married, then all of a sudden I see her. She's now got her big phony tits and everything. She's totally changed her look. I better use some Tic Tac, just in case I start kissing her. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet, just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the pussy, you can do anything. So this is rape culture, or it's one of the many different ways in which rape culture is expressed and reproduced in society through language. And this quote is, of course, the words of the sitting US President Donald Trump in a behind-the-scenes 2005 recording from Access Hollywood, released by the Washington Post in October 2016 during the election campaigns. Rape culture is a phrase and a term which is often used without definition or explanation. This is rape culture, we say, when faced with Trump statements. But the concept actually has a long history in both academic and um, activist writing. Rape culture, according to this decade-old definition, is a social cultural context in which male dominance is eroticized and where young men and women are taught that male aggression is a healthy and normal part of sexual relations. So scholars have highlighted the ways in which rape cultures permeate through all sections of society, how it's not tied to a certain region of the world, but experienced, although differently, around the globe. At the heart of this concept is the idea that rape culture is not perpetuated by irresponsible women and monster men, but by the reproduction of gender norms that tell women around the world that their bodies are not theirs, as Marco Martins has argued. The Trump campaign and his supporters were quick to turn to social media in defense, or in his defense, arguing under the hashtag locker room talk on Twitter that there's a big difference between saying horrendous things about women and, women and doing horrendous things to women. 
As a response, on the same night the tape was released, Canadian author Kelly Oxford posted a tweet asking women to break the silence and share their stories, assault stories, um, of sexual abuse and violence. Within hours, she was receiving um, she was receiving two assault stories per second, and within 24 hours, she'd received more than 100, uh, 10 million responses. In doing so, Oxford and the millions of women tweeting under the hashtag NotOkay were complicating and challenging the alleged disconnect between words and action. The sheer number of stories being shared in the context of this particular hashtag conversation serve as a reminder of the ubiquity and everydayness of sexual violence that has previously been addressed in, for example, the Yes All Women hashtag as well. By refusing to normalize and legitimize what was uttered on the tape and brushing off the president's words as innocent locker room talk, millions of women and men were calling attention to the fact that there's a very direct line between degrading discourse about women, the way we think and talk about issues such as sexual violence, and the lives and very real experiences of misogyny and abuse of women around the world. Another example, this time from Denmark, is the Jable Voltel, or I was raped hashtag, which was initially launched by the Danish newspaper Information in January 2016. The editor-in-chief, Anna von Sterling, much like Kelly Oxford, started by sharing her own rape story before encouraging survivors around the country to share theirs. A total of 35 of these stories ended up being feature articles in the newspaper in a 10-part series that ran as digital and print version over a period of several months. And the hashtag is still used today in over conversations, in Facebook groups, online newspaper comments, Reddit communities, and elsewhere. The impetus to make women share their stories was essentially about removing the stigma associated with being a victim of rape. And to show that although every assault is unique, the feeling of guilt, shame, and doubt runs through every account. But beyond challenging shame and stigma, it's also about calling out and exposing the subsequent victim blaming and slut shaming women face in the aftermath, not least by police and judiciary systems if choosing to report the rape. The digitally connected conversations facilitated by the Iris raped hashtag in Denmark thereby addressed another dimension of the issue at hand, which is the victim blaming and re-victimization inherent to rape culture in which blame for the crime is redirected onto the victims themselves, or the perpetrator's culpability is reduced and trivialized by referring to gray zones or explanations with reference to women dressing like slots, wearing makeup, or having consumed alcohol. These and related issues are being discussed under hashtags such as never your fault and not asking for it and not least brought center stage during the recurring slot walk marches, which at its peak in 2011-12, mobilized thousands of women in different parts of the world to march the streets dressed provocatively after a police officer in a, an official statement related to a series of rapes around a Toronto University campus told women to stop, stop dressing like slots in order to avoid getting raped. These kinds of hashtag campaigns have faced a lot of criticism, not least from feminist media scholars who rightfully warn us not to uncritically buy into these imaginaries of digital sisterhood. And of addressing the limitations of not only Twitter, but of social media in general as tools in creating social and political change. Hashtag campaigns uh, have oftentimes been written off as so-called clicktivism or slacktivism terms used to denote a new generation of lazy activists that participate in online activism, activism for the sake of trending without serious consideration of social issues or commitments to bring about real uh, social or political change. Criticism has also been directed at the socioeconomic structures behind a platform such as Twitter that's inherently irreconcilable with the activist projects that they're being used for. Jose van Dijk, who's with us here today, hi. <laughs> Uh, in her work on the political economy of contemporary social media platforms, bring attention to how Twitter users automatically fall prey to the interests of large-scale social media corporations who profit from their need to connect by harvesting invis invisible back-end data. Twitter, in this sense, is part of a dominant digital culture which not only profits from, but also dictates and regulates how activists should connect today if they want to be seen or heard. And there are obvious exclusion mechanisms embedded in the technology, allowing those with access and skills to participate, whereas others are left out of the conversation. 
But I want to end on a more positive note here, arguing that by connecting the personal stories of individual women, the hashtag can help us see these personal stories as symptoms of larger societal problems, and as I mentioned, in broader structures of power and oppression. All movements require hope and ways of reimagining hope in order to endure. Feminist scholar Rosalind Clark argued that there is hope in a hashtag. Hope that is created through digitally networked solidarity for otherwise dispersed individuals. And hope in how these online conversations can become a reference point for understanding broader systems of injustice in which these single events or statements or stories form part. In this sense, we may understand hashtag feminism in relation to what Jose van Dijk has called cultures of connectivity to signal the broader shift in online technologies and cultures from practices of connectedness to practices of connectivity. Hashtag campaigns are not necessarily replacing on the ground, in the streets action or offline forms of connectedness and solidarity, but rather working in parallel to and in dialogue with long-standing forms of activism and feminist media practice. And Twitter is obviously not the whole story of contemporary forms of feminism. Hashtag campaigns are merely one aspect of a larger networked feminism that's characterized by complex forms of connectivity and which operates at the intersection of off offline and online and across activities and different actors. Activism on Twitter should never be understood in isolation, but need to be considered as part of a broader ecosystem of connective media in order to use another one of Van Dyke's concepts here. But put your work in the service of a specific cause, in this case that of calling out and raising awareness around rape culture, hashtag activism is a powerful way of making everyday sexual violence visible for the world to see, and to remind us how rape culture is reproduced not only by presidents and police officers, as the examples I brought here today, but surround us in images, advertising, fashion, joke, pop culture, language, and laws. To be sure, digitally networked media, not least hashtags, are currently changing feminist discourse and movements, but doubt is often raised as to whether these forms of action and campaigning will, in the long haul, help bring about equality and gender justice. The cases from the US and Denmark that I've highlighted here today are only two examples from a recent and much broader and diverse upsurge in new forms to feminist action and campaigning. And as such, they pay testimony to one of the many different ways in which digital media practices are currently being put to work in the service of movements for gender justice. In the specific national context in which they played out, they did in fact help raise debate about a difficult subject and move the conversation outside of feminist circles into broader public debates beyond the circles of like-minded. And in that sense, they do show us that there is indeed hope in a hashtag. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, the criticism that you said that this movement has, uh, has received, like being excluding or being just slacktivism, um, have people within the movement um, reacted to this? And if so, how? Um, I think we reacted in the sense that they would be calling out the tweeting or posting on Facebook is not the only thing that we're doing. And so if we isolate um, activism to what's going on, on on social media, that's very easy to criticize. But people engaged in these kinds of questions are obviously doing other things and are engaged elsewhere. So I think that was, would be their response in a certain sense. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks. Um, time for open data, open access, open knowledge with the question mark. Digitalization and its effects on research. The professor at the Division of History and of Ideas and Sciences at Lund University, Thomas Kaiserfeld. Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> A few fingers in the air can be interpreted in many different ways. It can be a sign of victory can be a symbol of evil, can even be an insult. But many more times will they represent something much less intriguing, like numbers. If I raise three fingers in the air, like this, it usually simply means three. Now, Latin for finger is digitus. So digitalization of knowledge or information means that it is packaged as numbers. To package knowledge as numbers has turned out to have consequences. Since World War II, more and more information has been digitalized in order to be automatically processed in computers. 
Soon the effects were noticed, for instance in meteorology, delivering improved weather forecasts relying on these new tools to calculate movements in the atmosphere. Later, the same technology was used to put Americans on the moon. And nowadays, there no longer seem to exist information or knowledge that cannot be expressed as numbers. But digitalization is also something more, a transformative social and cultural process with elusive repercussions. We have tried to develop digital information processing since at least the 17th century. Then the idea caught on of the universe as a clockwork with regular movements which could be calculated in advance. God had created the world and was the prime mover, but divinity was no longer needed to make the world turn. Just as the watchmaker who had made the clock was no longer needed to keep it ticking in the pockets of the wealthy. This mechanistic worldview brought new perspectives on reasoning. Rational thinking could also be understood in terms of predictable claims and propositions. And thus, potentially, also the object of the same type of analysis as the clockwork universe. Thinking was compared to calculating. Advanced mechanical computing machines were constructed as was the chess playing automata seen here. Both of these items expressing the view of thinking as something reg regular and deterministic. Some of the greatest minds of this time tried to create a calculus that could be used to crank out all the possible logical truths there were. A rational language clean from all incorrections and lies. As I mentioned, from World War II, computers provided new possibilities to begin realizing the dreams of the 17th century mechanists of a perfect language free from errors and mistakes. And when internet was developed from the late 1960s, it started to become possible to make large amounts of digital information available simultaneously to innumerable connected computers. During more recent decades, smaller and lighter portable computers have been equipped with advanced radio technology, while cell phones have transformed into computers relying on generation after generation of mobile telecommunications technologies. And consequently, many people today have access to enormous amounts of information also when they are away from home or work. The potential uses seem endless. During past centuries, following the introduction of the printing press in the 15th century, information has been symbolized by books and libraries. Knowledge was contained on paper and in printed, ink, in printed texts. Retrieving information was the same as looking through collections of paper. No matter if it was a Shakespeare quote or a pancake recipe, but digitalization seems to slowly change all that. We talk about storing something in cyberspace or in the cloud. If information used to be bound up in paper and ink, it nowadays seems to float freely in space. Today, the view of information is that it flows frictionless from one device to another. And information has become remarkably immaterial. But this is indeed a misconception. In fact, quite a lot of hardware is needed to move digital information from one place to another. Satellites, base stations, cables, and optical fiber, to mention just a few. Take the research facility MAX4 here in Lund. One of their main problems right now, as I speak here, is how to get the channel capacity needed to move the thousands of terabytes each experiment generates to where it is to be analyzed. And in Luleå, in northern Sweden, a well-known American social platform, platform mentioned already a few times today, has built a big data center, 
because of the relatively cheap hydropower, which in combination with the chilly climate guarantee reasonably high energy efficiency for their servers. One of the main advantages when digitalizing information is nevertheless that it can be copied and spread much simpler, cheaper, and more reliably than before, when it was bound up in paper and ink. Where earlier a big copy machine was needed to produce bad copies of a book or a photograph, or advanced video equipment was needed to reproduce a film, more importantly, every generation of copies had lower quality than the preceding generation, Digital copying is simple, and it creates perfect copies. It is, of course, well known how this feature of digital information has made it very easy to copy and spread information. You can ask anyone in the music or film industry or any newspaper journalist. This feature of digital information has had consequences also for research. Primarily, perhaps, by facilitating the process of making research results as well as research data open and accessible. The demands for open access and open, da open data, as this is called, is often connected to the broader ideology which since, since the 1960s has acted under the slogan information wants to be free. Today, research funders all over the world often promote ideas of open access and open data by demanding that the research they fund is published in open access formats and that the data it generates is equally available to anyone. Taken together, it is today rather easy to acquire information and to some extent even knowledge without having to get to a certain location, such as a library or an archive or laboratory. To remember things is no longer very important since virtually anything can be looked up. If you're a historian like I am, there are of course many things that are still not on the net, despite, lar despite large multinational companies in the information business doing their very best to scan books and other prints from all over the world and all times, and likewise scan archival material of any origin. For copyright reasons, many of these databases are closed to a large number of people. Sometimes they can be open for those who are willing to pay. And today, research library, libraries as well as public libraries are spending larger and larger sums on digital databases. In this way, demands for open access and open data are countered by commercial interests investing in the construction of databases that are accessible only to those who pay for them. In my own field, history of ideas, Admission to a database can be purchased containing, say, all 18th century texts in English, fully searchable. With access to this database, it is relatively, I say relatively, easy to publish research articles based on searches, searches for terms such as manure. And then you can crank out publications on the development of sustainable agriculture in the 18th century. Just as in the natural sciences and medicine, it has become possible then to buy expensive digital research infrastructure to boost the production of research publications and career advantages when innovative, innovativeness is lacking. Taken together, the strive for open access and open data, as well as the simultaneous commercialization of searchable data has consequences for research. Not only are competitive advantages in research more often relying on expensive research infrastructures such as big machinery or large populations of test animals which can be used to create new or better data sets. Or by commercial databases, it also seems as if creativity and originality, the stuff that cannot be collected in data sets or programmed into algorithms, at least not yet, that creativity and originality is becoming a more decisive edge when all the rest needed to produce truly salient research is either openly accessible or for sale. Digitalization of data has thus created two somewhat contradictory trends. First, first, one where the ability to pay for information has improved the possibilities to pursue a research career relying on re routinized efforts, even though more and more research results and data are open and freely accessible. And second, 
One, where the generally boosted access to results and data has made originally and creativity high in demand. We know today that it took several centuries for the auto printing to be established as a new technology transforming information management. The consequences of digitalization will certainly be as great as those of the printing press. But although some of the signs of its impact are already showing today, it will most likely be several decades or even centuries until we will be able to fully understand all its consequences. If future research will be characterized by expensive databases or by open access and open data, is, for instance, still an open question. Until this question can be answered, though, one thing is absolutely certain. Digitalization is much more than only a few fingers in the air. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I'd just like to ask you, uh, if you are drawing parallels to the printing press introduction and say that we can, we can see similarities, um, can we then learn something from then that will tell us what will happen next? Of course, I should answer that question by resounding yes, <laughs> since I am an historian of ideas. And or you sciences. can say, no, we have no idea. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I have to confess that it, is, it would be extremely hard, and I, in fact, I think also dangerous, to try to do those type of uh, uh, metaphors or, or similar um, comparisons between uh, so, such vast uh, uh, time differences, really. So, as I would certainly say, maybe we can, but I wouldn't try to give you an example or anything would like that. Would rather look back and do it afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I think what it can do, though, I mean, studying the print and press and its impact, it can give you, uh, it can give you inspiration for how to look at our own time. So, so more inspiration that uh, a lot of very uh, th things that are very hard to predict can happen and will happen. So that type of elusive answer is the only one I can supply, I'm afraid. Thank, Thank you, you very much, though. <laughs> um, all right. Time for this morning's last presentation, Open Innovation and the Business of Software. We'll hear the Professor of Software Engineering and Head of the Department of Computer Science at Lund University, again, Per Jonasson. Welcome. Thank you very much. So, adding to the theme of openness, we heard about open data, open access, and now I will talk about open innovation and open software. Digitalization turns the way we do business with software upside down. This picture is taken from, do you know where? IKEA Museum in Elmhult. And their implicit message is that they have turned the furniture business upside down. Uh, however, I would, would not state anything about the furniture, but we can observe that software has made the business, uh, way of doing business, upside down. One example of this disruptiveness is how we value companies. When Minecraft was sold to Microsoft, they paid 18 billion Swedish krona. A few years earlier, the Volvo car company was sold for 12 billion. And as a Swede by heart, I thought that Volvo had higher value than Minecraft. So that's an example of how the software business definitely has changed a way of uh, valuing companies. And we can see in the top a uh, list of uh, highest value companies in the world, the top three are related to software, even though the revenue ranking actually is different. <clears throat> the phenomenon of paying internet services with data, or integrity, if you like, is also something that has turned the software business upside down. We are not expected, we don't expect to be paying by cash for services. We pay by other things. 
The concept of open innovation is a general business strategy, not specifically related to, to software, but it is in particular feasible for software. Open innovation is defined as a distributed innovation process across organizational boundaries using pecuniary and non-pecuniary mechanisms. Keywords in this definition are, firstly, the access uh, across organizational boundaries. So multiple companies or organizations are involved in developing the software. Secondly, money may or may not be part of the transaction between the actors. In practice, this means that companies may give away or exchange their corporate assets with collabor collaborators or competitors under certain conditions. A typical imp implementation of open innovation in the software business is open source communities. There, software engineers work paid the by their employees side by side with individual hobbyists and university researchers to develop joint software projects. We have studied this phenomenon in the open source communities around the tools Jenkins and Gerrit, where Sony Mobile uh, appeared to play a significant role. Both these uh, communities develop tools that are used when developing software. Jenkins is an open source build server used when continuously uh, creating new versions of the software. Gerrit is an uh, open source code review tool used when uh, scrutinizing the quality of a piece of software. We, meaning m in practice my PhD student Hassan Munir and his co supervisor Dr. Christoph Nuck, mined the software repositories to understand who contributed to these tools, and what did they contribute? Then we interviewed in depth five contributors from Sony Mobile. The picture that emerged uh, looks like this. There was a separate department within the company that interfaced towards the open community. Uh, then there is a knowledge, kind of a knowledge, knowledge transfer process that uh, was established between the company and the community. Uh, the knowledge transfer is conducted through the open software in itself, but also in chat rooms and physical meetings uh, and hackathons arranged by the community. We found out from our study that it is beneficial for the companies to contribute to share their software openly with uh, the, com the uh, competitors and collaborators rather than keeping it propriety. How can that be beneficial for the company? In order to understand that, we have to look into <coughs> some characteristics of what is special about software innovations and, what's, and the business related to, to software. First, it has very low initial costs. You can basically start a software business with an old PC, and you can rent server capacities in the cloud uh, when scaling up the service capacity uh, gradually. There is, at least in principle, a global market. The internet technology is the same everywhere. Uh, however, in practice, there are local markets there are local regulations which challenges the, the globality of the market. Problems with software innovation include that the legal framework for protect, protecting intellectual property is not very feasible for software. You can't, for example, uh, patent pure software innovations. Software innovations are also hard to monetize. It's related to, especially when we talk about internet services, where we are used to pay them uh, by our data and clicking behavior rather than with uh, money. 
There is also an aspect of software that is different from physical uh, designs, and that's related to the maintenance costs. Software doesn't decay like mechanic, mechanical contra, constructs do, but as the environment changes, the software has to be kept up to date all the time, which is uh, not, it doesn't create any new value, value of the software, but that's needed to keep the value of the software. So there are high long-term maintenance costs for software. So, and several of these characteristics speak for the advantage of open innovation implemented as open source software. Still, the question remains, how can, you make, can a company profit from giving away uh, software? There are four different uh, principal business models for software. Uh, the one we have used for long is the licensing model, uh, but that we can't apply for open uh, source software by definition, because the uh, license for software is, is free. However, there are alternatives. The most common is embedding uh, the software in products. Uh, the customers pay for the car or for the phone, although the software is the, uh, what contributes to the specific value you are buying. Companies can sell services related to the open software. Red Hat is an example of a company that packages open source software in a user-friendly way and thereby pro provides an extra service to the customer. And you can let someone else pay. Advertising, uh, like Google and the other ad uh, versions, which in practice means that we pay by our, our own data. Especially when it comes to software platforms and tools, <coughs> the open uh, innovation model is beneficial. Software platforms uh, are the general mechanisms or basis on which we, the suppliers, can build applications on top of maybe operating systems, database systems, or uh, the like. And you cannot, it mostly, uh, you do not distinguish yourself by uh, the characteristics of the platform, rather what you build on top. So it's not what he's climbing on, the guy here, but what he's doing on the top that is making the business. The same holds for tools that you use in the development of your software. Rally, they give you the very specific competitive edge uh, to uh, develop your software. So, uh, in that case, we concluded from our study that open innovation provides a, a, an opportunity to share development and maintenance costs. Uh, you may free up uh, resources then to spend on developing, developing services that provide your company with a competitive advantage. It may also provide better quality assurance since there are more users using the same uh, software and uh, tr finding out what uh, should be changed. And you may get faster releases and upgrades uh, as you don't have to wait for formal release plans um, of proprietary com companies. You can release whenever you like to. So, in summary, uh, we conclude, based on our research on open innovation in software engineering, that it is more blessed to give away software tools openly than to keep them closed. This statement is not new, as you may know. It's an ethical guide from the first century. Uh, however, it's mostly been interpreted uh, as a painful to adhere to, and definitely not a business rule. But in our research on uh, open innovation in software engineering, we found evidence that this may be a valid business strategy. 
It may be beneficial also in economic terms to share software openly instead of keeping it proprietary. Isn't that to turn business upside down? And we have summarized this in my shortest ever academic paper, a tweet long sentence in the tiny transactions on computer science. Sharing software tools enables open innovation, brings faster upgrades and frees up resources, but demands invest investment in the open community. So as a consequence of this openness strategy, an employee has to work, work both for her employer and for the community. The company invests efforts in the community which create goodwill for the company and trust, which later may be turned into, a, may be used to turn the community into the direction you would like it to. The challenge here is for companies and individuals to make this balance. For managers to understand and lead this type of business as also a new and totally different way of leading business. On the other side, the upside is that you may have people working for you without paying the salaries. So, in summary, in the context we studied tools for software development, the company turned into open source tools instead of paying licenses for proprietary tools. Whether it is beneficial also for product software, that remains to be studied. But under these conditions, we have observed that the 2,000-year-old ethical rule holds not only as the ethical rule, but as a business rule within the domain of software. Thank you. Thank you, Per. Um, you said that the, the leaders of businesses need to sort of consider this and work with this. Could you give us any like, hands-on example of how that is done in an optimal situation? I think it's, uh, there are several uh, both managerial and uh, legal aspect that has to be uh, considered and arranged for within a company. And what happens when the designers, the developers, the software engineers, they work in the open communities, they make very important business decisions. They make technical decisions which are coinciding or, or intertwined with business and legal decisions. If they make wrong choices there, they can ruin the, the company. Uh, so it's, it's very much about making the developers also, not, not only good technical developers, but also aware of the, the business and the legal framework which, in the, uh, the, with their, which they are working in. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Per, actually, you can take a seat and we can invite the rest of the speakers up here to take a seat also. Welcome back, all of you. I will open for questions in just a moment, and I really hope you have some, because we still have the tremendous catch box right here. Uh, but I'd like to ask you one thing. Um, something that, uh, there's an expression, a term that I don't think any of you used, but in some way some of you have touched on it, at least indirectly, the digital divide. Uh, the gap opening between those who have and those who don't have, those who have access, those who can participate. Uh, Tina, you mentioned a little bit on this. I'd like to hear, um, if not all of you, at least some of you reflect on what this means to the field that you're studying. What's the relevance uh, in where you're looking at, Stefan, you're looking at consumer issues, for example, part of the open innovation. Um, some reflection on the importance of the digital divide and what we can, uh, what could be done to bridge it. 
uh, definitely a very relevant question on Professor Lessig's um, <laughs> area, but um, anyone, open word. Stefan? Yeah, like you want yeah I'm, I'm thinking about um, yeah, my data perspective I was presenting upon, uh, um, and uh, I'll forget the question. Uh, do people regard um, data collection uh, differently amongst uh, you know, old and young and different types of groups? And uh, some su studies suggest that. I mean, and we have both studies who shows that at least in Swedish youth tend to be less concerned uh, about sharing data, very much data, than the than, than, than older age groups. On one hand. On the other hand, we have studies showing that there is at least one kind of a uh, young male group are much more concerned than all the other groups and, and much more inclined to use like ad, um, what do you, um, almost, yeah, ad, ad blockers, thank you, I lost the word. So there's this kind of little, little group are really concerned and they are still young, young and male. So uh, that, that's, that's another type of digital divide, but it's still some sort of d digital data sharing divide going on too, mm. sure. The digital divide I'm coming to think about is which companies that are able to, to follow in the development of the product and services. We, we see really disruptiveness that uh, new services arrive from an angle where we didn't expect them to come. So what, what is the core comp competence of a company? And we can take something that has happened since long, uh, public transport. Uh, it's no public transport agency that owns buses and trains. They own the data about the travelers. They might own the ticketing system, but then others are running the buses and trains. And we see that change happen in several kinds of businesses, that what we see, what we think is uh, what constitutes the core of the business tends to be something hidden. It's in the data, it's in the software that's running the business, not the physical entities that we see. Mm. Do you know? Well, in what I'm studying, I think the digital uh, divide often um, translate into a sort of generational divide. And there has been a lot of sort of discussions within sort of the, the feminist movement where uh, previous generations of, of feminists have, have accused new generations of, of young people of not being politically engaged and not sort of carrying on the legacy of, of the kind of work that they have been doing. And, um, and I think that, to some extent, has to do with a kind of general or generational divide in terms of where people are engaging today and how there might be some sort of blind spots between generations as to where action is taking place. It seems that our historian uh, thought the same. Thomas, you were nodding. Yeah, Maybe certainly I agree with that. And I was also thinking, well, research-wise, you, you get reminded of a divide when you communicate with people in the third world. Uh, you know, you offhand send away a word file, and then you get the reply back to say, please, could you send it in an open format so that they also can read it, like a PDF or something? So, so that's a good reminder of that this divide also exists in the research. Yes. in the research community. Mm -hmm. Lawrence? Yeah, I, I also think there's a critical divide generationally. So um, when I was a kid, I, I, I traveled to the Soviet Union and I was on a train to, uh, what was then, um, or to, to, I was to, going to Moscow and um, I was sitting next to someone, and I happened to sit next to somebody who spoke English who was, was a professor and, and he said to me, you know, in the Soviet Union we have a richer tradition of free speech than you do in America. So this is 1982, and I'm <coughs> it's like, you know, what could that possibly mean? And he said, no, I'm serious. He said, in America, you read, you take your newspaper, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and you read it, and you think you're reading the truth. But in Russia, we know we're constantly being lied to. So we have to read seven or eight newspapers and then triangulate on the truth. And that makes us much more critical readers and, and thinkers than you are in the United States. And I kind of laughed at it at that point, but as I look at the internet today, I kind of have the sense that we've now become the Soviet Union on the internet. Because like, you know, my father gets an email and it says, 
Obama's a Muslim, and he forwards it to me, and he says, Obama's a Muslim, <laughs> but you know, none of my students get those emails or see something on the internet and you know, immediately jump to the conclusion it must be true. They, like the Soviets, have learned to triangulate on the truth, and I think this divide is really critical because what elected Donald Trump was a bunch of people like my father, not a bunch of people like my students. Hmm. Maybe a little bit encouraging. I'm not quite sure, actually. Um, questions from you? Any hands in the air? Yes, at the very back. OK, great. That makes me give this a long shot. OK, you'll probably have to help me here, all right? That was my best. And hold your hands up. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for a good uh, session. My question is, um, how do you guys think uh, new technologies uh, that are evaporating, like machine learning and stuff, that most people have no clue about how it works. And we saw a lot of, I uh, also read some articles about a company called Cambridge Analytica and how they used um, these technologies during the Brexit campaign, maybe, and uh, the Trump administration. How do you think this um, affects the, uh, the, the political uh, landscape? and normal people, how they understand what they read, if it's generated by people or computers. Anyone wants to grasp that? Stefan, you talked about the black box. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question, really, because these the tools, at least part of them, are uh, they seem to be like the, the most sophisticated tools you can use. Uh, and, and I'm not sure if there's a link between the usage of really sophisticated tools in order to figure out what the, you know, uh, the, the, the voters are heading in terms of uh, what they're going to vote and, and their perception of it. So uh, could you clarify the question or could the panel help me? The, was it that the fact that people don't understand the technology yeah, uh, my question is, I'm sorry for being a little bit unclear. My question is rather uh, that we, we're moving towards more high-tech solutions that normal people base usually have no clue about how it works. They just see the front end or the, the Twitter page or the Facebook page, but they have no okay. under basic understanding for the underlying technology. I would say, it's, to me, uh, as I interpret it, it's more related to Lessig's, uh, you know, how you experience truth. So if you don't understand uh, or even can, you don't talk much about filter bubbles or any of those types of attempts to understand how we kind of get polarized using uh, algorithms or social media and stuff like that, then you could never criticize it. You would just accept what shows up. And, and it's really just your bubble showing up. So that would be the problem. And, and then we're back to the triangulation issue, I guess. How we regard, how we handle truth and how we perceive truth, or when we question it and not question it. Mm. Pan? Uh, trying to, to see your question more as, as a, a more general perspective on technology. Do we have to understand technology as general people? And we practice in many cases that we, we don't understand technology, and still we trust. I mean, I'm drinking some water here. We had trouble with the water here in Lund for weeks. I don't understand how I can get clean water. I don't understand what the trouble was, but I trust the experts that they, they measure. I trust the transparent system that they measure and they, they monitor. So the question to me is not primarily on the technology, but how we build the trust in the technology. What uh, uh, guarding mechanisms, organizations around the technology that can give me enough trust that, yes, I'm willing to trust that, or no, I'm not willing to trust uh, the outcome of that technology. Because I guess the difference is that you can be pretty sure that somebody is actually trying to provide you with clean water. That's sort of the whole point. It's not more complicated than that. So even if you don't understand how it's done, it is done somehow. But we can't really trust internet to provide us with the right and best information for us. So how do we go about, um, I don't know, uh, Lawrence, do you think that there is any way we can go about 
um, making us more, do we need to be more Soviet Union? Do we need to be more, become more, not necessarily tech savvy, but info savvy uh, when we're on the internet? And would that be a solution? Or do people actually need to know the technical basis of what's happening? Well, I, I mean, yes, I think we have to be more Soviet, number one. Um, it's one of those statements that taken out of context is going to get me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, but I also think we need to think more critically about the um, incentives of various institutions. Um, it's a really fantastic book in the United States talked about um, the um, American um, Psychi Psychiatric Association, um, which... Uh, was being funded by drug companies for many, many years. Um, and as they were funded, they started developing characterizations of uh, um, conditions that would direct people to using certain drugs. And after a while, legitimate questions were raised about whether their whole incentive was towards benefiting drug companies or benefiting patients. And that was a structural, institutional question. Um, which, um, which you know, should have set up raised red flags much earlier than it did, um, and gives one a good reason to uh, worry about the particular recommendation that might exist. It could be different from the story you were telling about water. I mean, if you've got um, a city that's providing water, um, there's not as clear a conflict of interest that might be uh, involved there. Um, so I think in the context of the internet, we've got to worry, we've got to think about: is there a reason not to trust? Um, uh, uh, and be much more um, critical about uh, what might be leading institutions to be untrustworthy in this context than, uh, th than we otherwise uh, might be used to, long before we worry about you know, understanding the way Python works on, on a particular site or not. Right. I, I, fully, I fully agree, but the question is not primarily related to trusting the technology but right. to oh. trusting the, the organization or the, the interests behind the, what we're looking well, but, for. But like if you've got a news site, I mean one of the most amazing and terrifying things about news sites right now is they have automatic algorithms for changing the headlines as they find the most clickbaitable headline possible. Is that the technology or the institution? I mean, it, it, from my perspective, it doesn't matter. The problem is, you know, is it facilitating understanding or is it just flaming a polarized uh, war? Right. Thomas? Yeah, I, I totally agree that uh, we focus a lot on technologies and think that is the heart of the matter and forget about the social institutions, which are just as important to try to understand if you want to change things. That's, so I totally agree with that, yeah. Mm. Okay, so we want to pass the catch box over here and Turn around, lift your. Oh, that's he rose up from his seat. That was really, really brilliant. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for this morning. I have a question that ties directly into this, that has to do with our social institutions, and that is, very many of them were molded on the foundations and designs and structure of our industrial society. So when our parliaments grew up, they were molded into the context of riding a horse to Stockholm, for example, which obviously parliamentarians don't do today. And I'm thinking that in this more digital age, how does that affect uh, policy making today in this context? Should we sort of reframe our social institutions and our political institutions to map towards where we are today in a digital context? Or should we stay in a situation where we are sort of framed in this sort of older kind of framework that might not map to where we are today. Ooh, that was a tricky one. <laughs> Should we stay in the old framework? Yeah, I'm thinking that the social institutions were very much molded upon foundations of how we live, work, and breathe in the context of a non-digital world where we build up these physical institutions which were had to be physical to go there and express our voice, etc. Now I can phone somebody or I can email somebody or be on a web page or whatever in, in Facebook. And that obviously changes how conversation takes place and how I can influence and how I can perceive the world. 
And so how would we sort of by law reshape and reframe and remold these institutions so that they are better apt for the situation where we are today? Right. Okay. Uh, so, per, so, to, Thomas and then Per. So that's the question for an historian. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I think that uh, we have no choice. Of course, uh, well, technology and institution will co-adapt because I don't think one comes before the other. There are no historical examples of that anyway. But the question is really, can we adapt continuously? Or will the, um, if, we, if we part between, say, technology and institutions, will there be divisions that grow and grow and grow till we get a crisis and we'll have a more of a revolutionary type of, of change? So that is really the question, I think. And, and the answer, well, that's not for me, but perhaps for Per. <laughs> <laughs> per, and then Stefan and Lawrence. No, not really, and I'm, I'm not historical, but I, I like the historical perspective. And uh, as Thomas said, I, I would also say that the, the, the small steps, we can see where there is a mismatch. There was uh, last week a discussion of, of who is overseeing uh, the Swedish television's publication, public publishing on the internet. And there, there is a mismatch because uh, the, the authority overseeing the radio and television cannot oversee the internet publications. And that, that's an apparent uh, indication that there must be a change, uh, which now people have been aware of for a decade. Uh, but the, the bigger question is the, the disruptive steps if there are institutions that have to take totally different perspectives given the new scenery we have. And that's what your coming, uh, look, looking back, will say if we manage or not. Stefan? Uh, just a comment. Uh, the, the question is uh, really rich. You could uh, divide it into a bunch of questions. But one, one, uh, one issue I've uh, been interested in for a long time is uh, law, legal institutions, and also uh, from a social legal perspective. And one of the issues is that it's most, of, most of those structures are kind of path dependent just to throw in that terminology. So it's kind of backward looking in a sense. So it's always like a, um, a lag in change. So, so it, uh, for instance, in this case, a commercially driven societal change in a sense that you could call that Google and Facebook stands for in one way. It's the legal institutions can't just adjust over five years or 10 years. And that, that's really quick in terms of the legal institutions. I mean, we have still, Parts of our legal setting is, you know, the Roman Empire law, 2,000 years, and it still kind of works, but it's still, uh, you know, functioning. So it's this kind of retrospective lag, path dependence, also conceptual path dependence. We tend to understand things like they used to be when we, we look at the new stuff. So, so like, like the first cars were built like, uh, you know, horse and carriage in a sense, but with an engine on, because we're kind of, uh, slowly <laughs> adapting, and our cons concepts are also kind of lagging in a sense. So it's a, that's just kind of underscoring the issue, but the lag we have to deal with too, I think. Mm -hmm. Lawrence? Yeah, but I think that it does raise the need to insist on critically questioning these institutions. I mean, for example, think about the issue raised about open source publishing. Um, you know, no, no one would have said to a scholar in the 1970s that there was an ethical issue raised when he or she published in a journal that didn't make its work freely available to everybody because there was a kind of necessity to the business model of publishing in journals that you sold to libraries and those libraries paid you significant money because it was an expensive project and that all made sense. But today, I think every scholar has an ethical question that he or she needs to address, answer uh, when he or she chooses to publish in a journal that restricts access to um, people freely. I mean, you know, the third world or others in the, um, in the academic community, I think, um, have a legitimate complaint when you publish in a restricted way if you have an equally available way to publish in an open access way. Now, it's a complicated question. If you're a, if you're a young scholar, and you need to get tenure or something like that, and you need to publish in the most prestigious journals, and those prestigious journals are closed 
Soros, well, I understand your decision, and I would criticize the journals, but I understand that. But if you've got tenure, and you've got status, and you've got nothing that you need, and you've got a choice like this, I think, you know, we ought to say you have an ethical obligation to make the work available, and so publish in a way that makes it available, and don't accept journals who say to you, you can't. We have, okay, let's see. The lady over here on your same row, pretty much. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, all for some really amazing talks. My, uh, my question is actually for Tina. Um, <clears throat> I was really, I, I thought you had a really interesting project um, about this kind of global response to uh, attempts to sort of moral or normalize a particular kind of violent discourse. Uh, about rape culture, about the celebration of a, a kind of like aggressive masculinism. Um, and I was really drawn to one of your images of two different tweets. And so one of them was, uh, you know, well, I think it was Kelly Conway, yeah, was that right? Um, was asking people to sort of tweet their stories about having been assaulted or abused. Um, and then there was another tweet above it, which was, a uh, hashtag about uh, liberals are desperate, Trump 2016. So there's this sort of, there was this, I think, very, at least kind of in uh, US Twitter, right, <laughs> which I'm more familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, this kind of reactionary response to attempts to try to create a different kind of public discourse against mm -hmm. that more violent discourse, mm -hmm. right, about mm -hmm. masculine aggression. Uh, and I mean, it's anti-feminist. Now I think there's a kind of attempt to try to label it as sort of post-feminist, right? So I'm wondering if you could maybe say something about that. You know, are these communities having conversations with one another? Um, are they not speaking to one another in the US? And if you saw in your sort of comparative analysis anything like that uh, in, in, uh, in Denmark, um, or if you could say maybe something about is there a globalization of this kind of like post-feminist discourse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well. Tina? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. I think, I mean, I was taking on sort of the positive hat and trying to show examples of all the wonderful ways that the internet can sort of um, raise awareness around a certain topic. But as you say, I mean, there has been an equal amount of campaigns which are anti-feminist, and, and the kind of campaigns that I was talking about come with a huge backlash of anti-feminism, and we've seen all the I don't need feminism um, kind of social media campaigns as well. Um, so yeah, there, and so the US context is, is quite specific, and I think, I don't wanna be comparing apples and, and pears here, but I do think there's, there's something quite specific to both sort of the feminist anti-feminist uh, conflicts within the US feminist movement, and they're also sort of the black versus white feminist um, movements, and there's a lot of criticism of these kinds of campaigns also of being too white and of being sort of reserved for privileged uh, white uh, women, right? So I think that there is a, it's difficult to, to compare the two countries and that the kind of, um, the conflicts and the disjunctures are, are unique to, to these um, two specific uh, contexts, but that there's something sort of universal as well to, to how feminism is always met with a kind of backlash and how um, any kind of feminist campaign will, will have a, an anti-feminist backlash as well. Thank you. Okay, hands in the air once more. Um, I think we have the lady right over here, trying to. Uh, oh, once more, both hands up so you can catch it. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to push back a bit against the privacy paradox that you mentioned, Stefan. Uh, I don't know, in my mind, there is no more of a paradox than people smoking or eating stuff that they know is unhealthy. Uh, people are concerned about privacy and they use these services because the convenience factor or the social value that they entail is too important. And that goes back to what we talked about um, earlier today, that they facilitate the, the social public infrastructure. So for many, most of us, I guess, there is a necessity of using them. So I think if we really want to promote privacy-friendly um, behavior or yeah, services on the net, we need to fundamentally challenge the incentive structure of these services because 
currently, the, the online business model does not favor privacy. Why, why would it? It thrives on data maximization. So I think that, that's, the, that's the challenge, more than the gap between what people say, their concern, and what they do. Then can we change those incentives, and how? Yeah, you yeah, can attempt, I think. I mean, now we have the data protection um, uh, for ordinary, GD, GDP, regulation, GDPR, thank you. That's at least one way of addressing um, yeah, one way to strengthen the individual's rights, right? So, uh, but it still it depends on awareness. You need to know who's collecting your data you, you, f to be able to kind of ask for it. Uh, so, to one degree, uh, to, to, I mean, I, I agree with you to the extent that people both know and still use out of kind of a necessity in a sense. But, but, but it doesn't explain. Because we are not all aware of all the collection. I mean, most of us are not uh, are only aware of some collection. I would say. I mean, there are a bunch of parties using and trading the data behind the scenes too. We could never ask for that data because we don't even know that they exist. Like the American Axiom, who has so much data on all the consumers in the world. So it's still an issue. How, how do you how do you treat people's? How do you treat the fact that we are limited as cognitive beings? In a sense, we can only have like three things in our head at the same time. We know that Facebook and Google does things, but the other hundred, how should we address them and deal with that kind of issue? We, it's, it's more an infrastructure of data collection, uh, which is problematic. So, uh, okay, the answer is still, how do we change the incentive for the market, I guess? Oh, yeah. You mean you didn't have the answer? No, 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 no. <laughs> <answer. Yeah. laughs> no but but uh, forcing more transparency is one one uh, action, but it won't solve the entire issue, at least. I mean, if you access uh, a website and there's uh, 100 collectors of data online, on behind the scenes, mm -hmm. uh, if you force transparency to that, you might uh, raise awareness and, and the consumers will be more informed, but you, you won't. Yeah, so people could under competition, choose another website to visit or use another news agency and stuff like that. But still, it, it only solves little, I think. Mm. True. Um, we are about to wrap up uh, because I'd like to ask the panel to do one final thing. Uh, this is a scientific symposium. We're all here because we're looking for new knowledge in the digital area in different ways. And I'd like to hear each and every one of you say something about some part of research that you would like to delve deeper into, some issue that you think is not enough covered yet and you'd like to look closer at it, or um, if there is some uh, issue connecting to your field that you think that somebody else should look closer to, uh, to increase our knowledge and increase our possibility to live successfully in the digital world. Um, what do you want to know more about, I guess would be the simple phrasing of that question. Stefan, do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I need a... No, no, this, I mean, there's so many things I want to know more about. I'm so happy I we're here. I can just pick one. Yeah, 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 <laughs> but just, just stress the fact that you, you said that uh, so you don't know the answer. No, of course not. I mean, and sometimes that's important not really know the answer because we, we have to figure out the, the best questions first, right? So that would be one question. How do you change the incentive? for a market that's completely driven by collecting data when we see so many side effects to it that we don't necessarily like. So that's a that, good question. That's a good one. Hmm? Thomas? It's a hard question. Well, first of all, I would like to know more about how manure is addressed in 18th century <laughs> British texts. Okay? Absolutely. <laughs> well, don't we all? I'm going to get that to that database. That's a simple. <laughs> no, but of course, uh, how are, well, actually, I'm interested in what has been up here today. How do technology and social institutions interact around information technologies historically? So to me, that's actually not as much, uh, not as much research as you would uh, believe. So. OK, Per? I would put forward the privacy awareness and how we can design a technology to support the privacy awareness and protect the individual. And we actually have, together with Stefan and other colleagues from Lund University, an application which resides in a special 
store in Stockholm somewhere, uh, which we hope will be positively evaluated, and then we might have a little bit of an answer in a few years. Or more questions. <laughs> Thank you, Per. Tina? Well, difficult question, but I think I would be interested in so the question of how do we create alternatives uh, to sort of the corporate social media structure that we have today? How do we create alternatives that are or systems that are not sort of um, uh, structured around economic incentives. And yeah. Thank you. Lawrence. So, uh, you know, I, uh, much of the work around democracy reform assumes we could get to a state when people actually liked their government. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to know whether that's actually true that it's possible for people <laughs> to like their government or to be, um, you know, in some sense affirmed in the, in the way that their democracy works. I mean, we will assume that's true and we'll continue to move there, but it would be nice to know if we're going to get someplace at any time soon. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for your attention and your participation today. I'm very grateful for this great panel today. So thank you. Big thanks to Lawrence Lessig, Tina Skanius, Per Jonasson, Thomas Kaiserfeldt and Stefan Larsson. Thanks. Applause